My name is Michio. I'm the president of Fridays for Future. Um, I would just like to thank everyone who came out today. I'd like to thank a lot of the organizers and the organizations that make this happen. Um, obviously, Fridays for Future, UConn Collaborative Organizing, UConn Unchained, Eco Husky, uh, Sunrise Connecticut, and countless others who have helped, you know, advocate for this event and who have helped share share the information, everything like that. So, just as a background, we are here today demanding divestment from fossil fuel holdings at the University of Connecticut. Currently, the Yukon Foundation invests millions of dollars every single year back into fossil fuel companies to get returns on their money. We are calling them out. We are the students. The students, the faculty, the staff at this school is what makes this university. Not the administration, not the people investing our money that we give so much of. So I would like to start off by introducing Sage Phillips to give a land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the lands on which we gather is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scattacook, Golden Hill Pagusset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Chi Willie Wini, thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, BDF. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is B. Diaz, and I'm a senior here at UConn. And I am here today with UConn Collaborative Organizing, Fridays for Future, and Power Up UConn. Today I am here to discuss why it is important for me, you, and everyone you know to fight for climate action here at UConn. The hard reality is that the leadership of our university proceeds to invest in fossil fuels, contributes to environmental injustice, and fails to engage in decarbonization efforts here at Storrs. UConn is a university that prides itself in their academic programs and ratings. Recently, the Sierra Club ranked UConn amongst its top 10 coolest schools list, claiming our university to be one of the most environmental friendly and sustainable campuses in the country. An important thing to note is that UConn continues to use tools powered by fossil fuels. So why pride ourselves in quoted sustainability rather than divesting from fossil fuels entirely? The movement towards sustainability does not stop here. The movement towards environmental justice at UConn is also bigger than fossil fuels and science itself. It also has to do with human decency. Time and time again, the Office of Sustainability continues to fail their students. Since the office was established in 2002, only eight students of color have been hired as interns, and two of which were black students. When students at the Office of Sustainability pushed for environmental justice efforts, they were told that their demands were too political. While UConn has led research on environmental studies and sciences, the university remains too comfortable and too compliant with the fossil fuel industry, big corporations, and their exclusive pedagogy. Protecting our PAC means divesting from fossil fuels. Protecting our PAC means establishing inclusive environmental spaces. Protecting our PAC means embracing social ecology into our education. As the president of UCO, we have worked continuously to promote intersectional environmentalism and radical love into our pedagogy and practice. We have collaborated with groups like Fridays for Future in efforts to divest from fossil fuels. As the LGBTQIA director of Power Up UConn, I can say that Power Up is working in communities like Manchester and Hartford to demand that town councils build greener spaces and provide healthier food options. Like UCO and Fridays for Future, Power Up stands in solidarity with student activists and groups. It is a shame that UConn relies solely on the efforts of student activists, and I am tired. I am burned out, and I am not the only one. I cannot continue this fight without UConn's help. Us students need your help to do better and to build a sustainable future. Environmental justice is a racial issue, a queer issue, a disability issue, and a class issue. Environmental justice affects everyone, and we cannot protect our PAC without taking sustainable action steps. Thank you. And now 
now I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Khadija Sheikh. UConn, you claim that we are a community that values the contributions of all of our members and the distinct backgrounds that we all represent. You claim you are committed to supporting each one of us as Huskies. Then how come my oppressors are able to keep their jobs? How come my oppressors are able to retire with their tenure? How come my oppressors did not have to sacrifice opportunity after opportunity, but I did? Where were you, Yukon? Why didn't you protect me as I am part of your so-called pack? Yukon, you pride yourself in thinking you celebrate diversity by throwing around buzzwords like diversity, equity, and inclusion. But what do those words really matter when a person of color is finally invited to the table but is shut down every time they speak? What do those words really matter when a person of color's experiences are belittled and ignored? What do those words really matter when a person of color, especially a woman of color, is used and abused for their mind, for their body, and for their time, and not compensated or even credited? In another climate, I could have said that I am grateful for my time at this university, for all of my experiences, including the bad ones. But I am not. You are wrongly mistaken if you think that I am. I'm not thankful for my experiences of being discriminated against, victim blamed, gaslighted, and threatened because those experiences invaded every cell in my body. Those experiences never ended. Those experiences are traumatic and they persist and every single day I live with them. Imagine being pressured to do work without being on payroll. Imagine hearing your friends be villainized by your supervisor for putting their mental health first. Imagine being told that you had to defend a racist institution because you were the only person of color at that institution. And after putting yourself first by resigning and saying no, you were attacked for stating the truth. You were attacked and belittled for sharing your experiences. And you were attacked and threatened for calling your oppressor out. Well, those supposed circumstances are real. I lived through them and so did many other interns at the Office of Sustainability. Our oppressor was able to retire with tenure. Our oppressor is able to con continue their job and our oppressor did not have to sacrifice opportunity after opportunity for the fear of their safety. We had to. Tomorrow, I'll be going with a cohort of students to attend the Conference of Parties, COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. And though it is a privilege to be able to attend, I need to be clear with you all. I had to fight and persist to go. See, after I was attacked and threatened by my previous supervisor for standing up for myself and resisting their oppressive system, I no longer felt safe to attend COP26 since my supervisors would be going alongside me. It is already nerve-wracking and frustrating to convince airport security that I deserve a spot on my plane, that I am not carrying explosives, though they pull me to the side during airport security and strip me of my hijab, strip me of my belongings and strip me of my identity to make sure. But while being humiliated in front of my entire cohort, in front of strangers, I would not feel supported by my own supervisors who are on the trip with me because they ridiculed, belittled, and attacked me for being who I am. So I had to give up this amazing opportunity because my, of my fear of feeling safe, welcomed, and supported by my cohort. It was a difficult decision and I understood that I only had one chance to go to this conference, but I knew I would not have a great time if my oppressor was there right alongside me. And it wasn't about, two, about three weeks ago that my friends encouraged me to demand justice from the program coordinator to explain why I quit because they didn't know why I quit and demand that my oppressor would be removed from the cohort so that I could return. And during these conversations, I learned that my traumatic experiences had become a personnel case and that multiple professors I worked with knew 
that the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion knew, that the provost knew, but without my awareness, without my consent, and all these people knew, higher up, higher up, administration knew, but nothing has happened to uproot the system of oppression. So when UConn claims to be a community that values the contributions of all of their members and the distinct backgrounds that we all represent, I don't believe it. It has been months now and there has been no real systemic change. I am an Indian Muslim woman who chooses to wear hijab, but I'm also an environmentalist. I know that is surprising for some people. I'm not a submissive housewife stuck in an abusive relationship. I'm not someone who was forced to wear hijab. Instead, I'm a resilient, passionate, loud, tenacious, and confident woman of color who is standing here to tell you that this university system needs to be uprooted. I'm here to tell you as a person with marginalized identities that our current system contributes to the historical silencing of marginalized peoples, especially in the environmental discipline. We are told that we are not interested in saving the environment, that we are lazy, that we are not outdoorsy enough, that we are simply not enough to care for our planet. And whenever we stand up for ourselves, we are knocked down. However, I'm here to tell you that even if we are knocked down, we must stand back up or crawl and demand that this university that prides itself in protecting its PAC to center our voices that are coded with radical love and intersectional environmentalism, that by uplifting our voices, do they stand a chance to save themselves from Mother Earth's wrath. We must not stay silent. Thank you. Thank you, Khadija, for sharing that. Next up, I would like to introduce Nell Srinath from Yukon on Chain. Thank you everyone for coming out today. My name is Nell, I use they, them, or she, her pronouns, and I'm a sophomore political science student uh, and president of Yukon Unchain, a radical anti-imperialist direct action group dedicated to serving the community and educating on the harm of capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism uh, and their effects on this people and the planet. My goal today is to highlight the vast array of climate injustices that we need to dismantle in order to form not only a more equitable and sustainable Yukon, but a more equitable and sustainable world. You know, whenever I see a crowd like this, I know some good shit is about to go down. <laughs> Why? Because whether you feel it or not, there is a special kind of energy in this crowd. It's an energy that feels small now, but if harnessed correctly, can be used to shake the institutions responsible for climate change to their core. It will have the rich men, men who bathe in oil for the price of blood, drought, and desolation, quivering out of their loafers. It will grasp our current political and economic system by the roots and plant something better, something new, something rooted not in voracious and insatiable principles of profit over human life, but in equity, reparations, and mutual love for one another, even those you don't even know. This energy is called global solidarity. Solidarity from me to you. Solidarity from you to your neighbor. Solidarity from your neighbor to someone in a, in a community halfway across the globe that they will never meet in their lifetime. Solidarity is when you take love to the streets, when you take love to the political struggle, and it is the most important tool we have to harness, uh, to eliminate the fundamental causes of climate change and save our Earth. But solidarity, as with energy, is useless without somewhere to direct it. Instead of thoughts and feelings floating around aimlessly in thick, obscuring clouds like the emissions of the wealthy, we need a diagnosis and we need action. So where do we direct this energy? See, what's amazing about most discussion on climate change is that it's done without pointing any fingers. There is a crisis, but no cause, which is almost as deceitful and problematic as outright denial. And what that does is let the real causes go accounted for, let the polluters and the robber barons get off scot-free. Here, Yukon, for the sake of this planet, let us be brave enough to name names, 
that ought to be named and point fingers that ought to be pointed. At the capitalist class, the enforcers of settler colonialism, the cheerleaders of imperialism, at the politicians who legislate in the favor, and those forces right here at UConn who invest in them. It is capitalism that empowers the minority who owns the means of production to extract the wealth of the working class and leave the physical byproducts of that exploitation to poison the air, the earth, and the water. The manufacturing of poverty through rent hikes, low wages, the debt industry, and the prison industrial complex are inextricably tied to climate change as the same regime that crushes the humanity of the marginalized has no reservations crushing our planet. And of course, these capitalists are destroying a planet distributed between them through the violent process of colonialism. The first step into the climate crisis was taken by the European settlers invading North America to satisfy their greed and attempting to violently erase indigenous ways of protecting, protecting the environment by way of forced removal, land theft, gendered violence, settler vigilantism, and an unquantifiable, de unquantifiable degree of cultural and population genocide. Settler colonialism also revealed its continuous relationship to the planet when it turned human beings into property through the genocidal regime of chattel slavery. To the capitalist class, no means of extraction and profit are off limits not even climate apocalypse. Now, settlers continue to violate the sacredness of the earth. The Biden administration, in spite of their bold climate promises, is mocking those most vulnerable to the effects of climate change by accepting fossil fuel drilling contracts on federal lands, which is to say, stolen lands, at a higher rate than the Trump and Obama administrations. Included in this horrific trove of poisoning permits was the Enbridge Lime 3 Tar Sands Crude Pipeline, completed a few weeks ago on occupied Ojibwe treaty lands. Enbridge, the Canadian company constructing the tar sands pipeline, the most harmful and pollutive kind of fossil fuel, has paid millions of dollars to reimburse Minnesota police departments for time and equipment spent brutalizing our indigenous siblings, fighting to protect their land, their water, and their sovereignty. This alliance between capital, the settler police, and the destruction of stolen land highlights exactly the climate injustice that we need to fight against here but on the state level and nationally. In Connecticut, the much beloved company Eversource is the primary owner of a fracking plant and pipeline to be built in Killingly, which is set to run through protected wetlands. The fight to stop environmental devastation is not a far off fight in which we are helpless. The fight is here at UConn, taking place as we speak. The UConn Foundation's investments, being protected by capitalist laws, are completely opaque to the public. We cannot yet know how our school is contributing to the ongoing process of colonialism and ecocide. This is all the more reason to div divest now. Say it with me. Divest now. Divest now. Divest now. Divest now. Divest now. Divest now. <laughs> Sorry, left you hanging on that one. <laughs> Finally, why is climate change a global phenomenon, not just in, in consequence, but in cause? Why are the world's poorest poised to suffer the most? Why does the United States fight so relentlessly for a foothold in North Africa and West Asia, the African Sahel and East Asia? Why have the people of the Global South been organizing and fighting relentlessly for decades to end the scourge of climate capitalism? The answer is imperialism. It is capitalism expanded globally. Through the offshoring of labor to Global South countries shaken by decades of Western intervention and completely dependent on Western finance, the United States and the European Union have as much license as they want to monstrous amounts of fossil fuels. The African Sahel is the most of, has the most polluted air on the continent because this is where the highest concentration of U.S. military bases are. In fact, the U.S. military is the most heavily carbon emitting institution in the world. To make ma matters worse, the U.S. military is completely exempt from the climate commitments uh, made at COP26, Kyoto, Paris, and so forth. UConn, which touts itself as a sustainable school, accepts grants from the U.S. military. From, uh, lost my place, sorry. There we go. Accepts grants from the U.S. military for research and lets army helicopters parade around our skies once a year. UConn has countless ties with war industry companies, including millions of dollars in contributions from Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and Electric Boat. On the Yukon Foundation Board of Directors, Stephen M. Greenspan, the Vice President and Chief Litigation Counsel at Raytheon. Aren't you so glad our money is in good hands? 
These co companies, which produce machines of mass killing, have a hold on our university, particularly the School of Engineering. If we are to become a sustainable school, we have to cut ties with industries of death and destabilization. There is nothing sustainable about imperialism. It does not help that even though the United States and Europe have the most historic carbon emissions, they have the majority of access to renewable technology, whereas Global South countries cannot develop their own without great fo greater fossil fuel emissions. Through the capitalist project of patents and intellectual property, the capitalists will not share this technology without the opportunity to bloodlet the South for profit. The U.S. empire does not cooperate. Take, for example, the genocide genocidal sanctions that the United States imposes on more than 35 countries that limits their economic development and prevents them from working with the rest of the world, often for the crime of opposing U.S. hegemony. Any serious advocate of sustainability should um, oppose sanctions, should oppose aggression and domination against the rest of the world, so true cooperation to end climate change is possible. Connecticut politicians such as Chris Murphy and Richard Blumenthal cheerlead these genocidal sanctions in their attempts to gain political clout with the establishment. We must oppose that as citizens of Connecticut, as citizens of the world. Before I conclude, oh, no, there we go. Before I conclude, I want to read a passage from a document that inspires me. It's the People's Agreement of Cochabamba, Bolivia from the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. Quote, the corporations and governments of the so-called developed countries in complicity with a segment of the scientific community have led us to discuss climate change as a problem limited to the rise in temperature without questioning the cause, which is the capitalist system. We confront the terminal crisis of a civilizing model that is patriarchal and based on the submission and destruction of human beings and nature that accelerated since the Industrial Revolution. The capitalist class has imposed on us the logic of competition, progress, and limitless growth. This regime of production and consumption seeks profits without limits, separating human beings from nature and imposing a logic of domination upon nature, transforming everything into commodities, water, earth, the human genome, ancestral cultures, biodiversity, justice, ethics, the rights of peoples, and life itself. Under capitalism, Mother Earth is converted into a source of raw materials and human beings into consumers and a means of production, into people that are seen as valuable only for what they own, not for what they are. Capitalism re requires a powerful military industry for its processes of accumulation and imposition of control over territories and natural resources, suppressing the resistance of the peoples. It is an imperialist system of colonization of the planet." End quote. Yukon, it will not be the politicians who save us. They have lied through their teeth to preserve the right of fossil fuel companies and military contractors to leave their bloody footprint across the planet. It is not private industry who will save us. How can we trust the assailant to heal our wounds? It is not billionaires who will save us. They fiddle while the earth burns by proposing bogus, genocidal solutions to overpopulation and earning tax breaks by giving minuscule proportions of their wealth to environmental NGOs. By the time drought and famine encroaches upon most of the earth, the billionaire class will be taking their spaceships to orbit, laughing at us from above. It is time to grab a wrench and loosen the screws on that rocket before takeoff, because it, it is we the people who will save us. We have to be brave enough to seize the means of power and production from the ruling class and steer us away from the, this death spiral into climate catastrophe that we are currently on. If you want to stop climate change, don't just sit there and swipe. Join an organization, help unionize your workplace, let your leaders know you won't take their bullshit anymore, because we don't have time for bullshit. It is time for action, it is time to divest, it is time for full transparency into Yukon's finances, it is time to end the use of fossil fuels, it is time to end the era of capitalism and imperialism that, the, that will bleed the world of its riches until there is nothing left. When the people rise against oppression, will you be a bystander? When the next pipeline is being built, will you do nothing? No. When the university refuses to hear us, will you stay silent? No. Say it with me. A better world is possible. A better world is possible. Are you going to help make that world Yukon? Yes. Woo, thank you. Thank you now for dropping that on us. That was lovely. Now I'd like to introduce the president of Eco Husky. Caitlin Dodona. Hey, what's up? 
Um, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Dodona. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior environmental science student, and I'm also the president of Eco Husky. Um, we're an organization that works on activism, education. Um, we're working on the activism. I will say, um, I'm going to have some words later in acknowledging our part as well as in the gatekeeping processes um, that have been happening at UConn sustainability. Um, but we're working, um, and we're also working to, for self-care and for appreciation of ourselves and our environment, so I'm excited. Um, I'm going to talk today about UConn's stake in the climate crisis and environmental injustice. And if you're here today, I know we've all been talking about the things that need to happen. We've been talking in classes, our professors, news, we keep hearing about all the problems that aren't solved and that people are giving up on solving. Um, I'm here today to talk about some feasible action, some <laughs> feasible action that we can do and we will do um, together. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna break down a report that came out. It was 50 pages, it was kept in the dark. Um, it's been removed from the president, Andy Aganobi's, um, if you did, I was mispronunciation, but it's been removed from his website. So you cannot find it unless you scroll to the webpage of that office that has removed three workers and has included only eight, eight workers of color um, in their offices. Um, you have to scroll to the bottom of their webpage even to find this report. Um, there has been a committee. Um, this was the President's Working Group for Sustainability and the Environment. It was created in response to the 2019 climate rallies um, where, you know, pre-pandemic, people showed out just like we are today um, to talk about what we need to do. Um, and that work came together and we created this committee. Um, the students were gradually weaned off the committee until there's only two left as of last year uh, when they made their final reports. Um, so we're gonna talk about the words you can use in that report, um, the actions they said, how they align with what we've talked about today in terms of system change, and what we can do to create something um, from those recommendations, and that's the bare fucking minimum. Um, excuse my language. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're also gonna end with some affirmations, and I want you to speak them loudly with me. Um, recommendation one, this is from a whole panel of faculty at this university and students and the president of UConn who was taken off from the board of trustees. Recommendation one, the university should publicly commit to retiring the stores, campus, fossil fuel energy infrastructure by 2040. Okay, supporting recommendation. This includes not continuing to invest in and carrying out the central utility plant and associated steam lines. If you wanna learn more about this infrastructure, check out this table and talk to us after. Um, our campus is creating or is run on almost 98% natural gas from the central utility plant here on campus. It was the same thing that was used by those reports in the Office of Sustainability to call us a cool school because it's co-generating, using natural gas, steam, and electricity. It's not good enough. Um, an action item, divestment. We're working on this. Check out the research table. Send an email to your admins. We have that on the QR code. Um, we are doing the research and join us students if you want to learn more. FFF, UCO, UConn and Chain, Eco Husky. Um, we have the meeting dates over there with Musa. <laughs> and then recommendation, another one. This one hit hard. Transparency and accountability in decision making and progress reporting. Clear communication to all stakeholders. Just a quick reminder, these are things written by UConn faculty and administration. <laughs> they publish this stuff. They publish that these recommendations do not represent optional improvements, but rather an emergency response that must be addressed as quickly and comprehensively as possible. So ask me why they took this progress report off their webpage and aren't telling any of the students. Why are we gatekeeping these processes? It's ridiculous. Okay, I'm going to keep on moving. <laughs> Let's tell Andy to publish this dang report on his webpage, please. <laughs> Spread the word, it's the least we can do. Um, also reach out, we have sustainability town halls coming in clutch from Michael Christie, Marisa Naclerio, and other student leaders who are trying to make these processes and get student feedback. Keep an eye out. We talked a lot about system change here, I see it on your posters, I hear it in conversation. And so we need to talk about this, the recommendations and where they went wrong. Burying environmental justice in the report. It was not part of the call to action. It was buried, you had to search for it. Let's talk about climate and racial justice here at UConn, the Office of Fucking Sustainability. In the report, it was told that this office successfully coordinates 
much of the sustainability efforts at the university, as well as leads many initiatives aimed at community behavior change. They created and are touting the school school report. In the meantime, they are discriminating actively against their workers. They are gaslighting students, they are threatening students, and they are allowed to keep their jobs. There has been things in the works to try to remediate this, but we need you to hold people accountable. Um, we'll have some forward messages on this office <laughs> on action items, but for there, just keep the seed. Um, in terms of adding a justice lens to existing and future sustainability efforts at UConn, this was the buried section. <laughs> Pride must be earned by understanding and making decisions that prioritize environmental justice for those bearing the unbalanced brunt of the environmental crisis. We suggest environmental justice. We suggest environmental justice topics be incorporated into every decision by all persons involved in the decision-making process. Where is this incorporation? <laughs> That's what I want to know. We haven't heard a dang thing. Um, I think we should talk about this as a student body at a town hall that's coming up soon, but we need action items on this specifically, and they are not in this report. I'll leave it there. Um, I'm gonna end with some affirmations. Um, I could tell you, I can go on and on about the infrastructure, about the divestment plans, but you can hear more about that at UConn door meetings. Um, there's a group of people here who like Nell said, we're small, but we have lots of love. We are talking about these things out of love for each other um, and, for, and for our futures. Um, so I want you to say it loud with me. Okay. <laughs> I am worthy of love. I am worthy of love. I am worthy of love from myself. I am worthy of love from myself. I am worthy of rest. I am worthy of rest. I will protect my energy. I will protect my energy. I will fight when I can. I will fight when I can. I will fight for the love of my future. I will fight for the love of my future. For the future of my friends. For the future of my friends. For the future of my family. For the future of my family. For the present of my family. For the present of my family. I'm going to take a quick break here for a second because environmental injustice is the fact that this is the present of our family. All we're hearing in the news is the future of climate change. This is the present day for people. People are surviving and fighting to survive in small island nations and everywhere that are being drowned out and. These people are not represented disproportionately in cost. We can do better. I am worthy of reimagining the systems I inhabit. I am worthy of reimagining the systems I inhabit. I am worthy of acknowledging racism, discrimination, and how these systems play in my life so I can grow. That was a long one. <laughs> we'll just hold that one. <laughs> yeah. No. I am worthy of calling myself out so I can grow. I am worthy of calling I am worthy of changing the systems I inhabit. I am worthy of changing the systems I inhabit. Okay, this is the last little chunk. This is my favorite. I am doing the best I can. I am doing the best I can. I will not let petty people with power gaslight student activist leaders. I will not let petty people with power gaslight student activist leaders. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> when I do the best I can, I am powerful. When I do the best I can, and capable of changing the systems I imagine. And capable of changing the systems I imagine. <laughs> I inhabit, but you get it. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna end with one more, um, and I wanna say thank you all for having me. Um, I feel very honored to be here with y'all and student leaders, and I keep doing this work. Um, yeah, okay. I wanna say this has been done. We have done work, and we have seen change, but it's not radical enough. We can do better, so. I'm excited that we'll continue to keep this momentum going. A last affirmation, I am worthy of divestment, period. I am worthy of divestment, period. Thanks so much, take care. Thank you, Caitlin, for that, and thank you, Emerson. Um, next, I would like to introduce the president of UConn Poetic Release, Iris Jordan. Environmental justice for the hood. One, there ain't no fresh food in the hood. But somehow, some way, we still.
still got pesticides running through our bodies. Don't nobody care what happens to low-income folk, because low-income folk never had it that good anyway. Two, the white people on the West End got it way better than we do. I said, the white people on the West End got it way better than we do. And trust me when I say, this shit is intentional. They pay people on the West End to come in and clean up their neighborhoods. They pay people on the West End to come up and clean up their neighborhoods. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in the North End, I've been looking at the same pile of trash on my street since the day I was born. And what does that say about the way that we live? What does that say about the way that we live? Do we care about poor people? Do we care about poor people? Do we care about poor people in the air that they breathe? Do we care about poor people in the trash on their streets? I'm gonna end it right there because this is an unfinished piece. But thank you guys for having me. I'm so nervous right now. This is my first time doing a poem in front of this many people. Yeah. Thank you. I really love what we're doing here today. Um, and, at, and the end of the poem was just, I'm really glad that we're here today trying to make change. I'm so sorry I ended it right there. I'm just really nervous, but I'm really happy to be here. Thank you guys for, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Iris, for sharing that poem. Can we give another round of applause for all the speakers today? So, I would like to finish up today and leave you with a few things. Before, we will be marching to Gully Hall, where the president, president's office is, so I hope you can join us. Um, but a few weeks ago, the University of Connecticut declared racism as a public health crisis on this campus, thanks to the tireless work of other organizers on campus and other student organizations. And so, with that, what does, what does racism being a public health crisis have to do with environmental justice? If UConn truly believes that, and is going to put power to those words, then they need to divest from fossil fuels. They need to take sustainability more seriously because environmental racism is very real and it's very apparent. And if the university does not take action and actually follow through with the words that they speak, then there will be issues. There will be problems as we go forward with environmental racism. And UConn is complacent in that fact. And if they truly believe that, uh, that racism, is, racism is a public health crisis, then they should take action on that and divest from fossil fuels. So before we go and march, and Nell will be leading us in that march. Woo! To, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, right over there, where Musa waving his hand, we have a QR code for people to scan. Um, and it's an email template that has, you know, pretty much everything that you need other than putting your name in. And we're trying to spam the administrations, people, the president, people at the Board of Trustees, people in the Yukon Foundation. We want to spam their emails and annoy them so that they realize we will not go away until our voices are heard. So please, before we start marching, take your time, scan, scan the QR code. And then we'll be marching down that way towards Fairfield Way. Go down towards, down, yeah, down all the way down Fairfield Way to Gully Hall. And I hope you can join. I hope you can be loud and make your voices heard. Thank you all for coming out today. Yeah.